Hi, my name is George Richardson, and I'm here to tell you how infrastructure as code should feel and give you some tips to lead you back to Nirvana if you've strayed from the path. Who am I to do that? I'm a senior consultant at the Scale Factory, where our mission is to become the leading AWS consultancy for SaaS businesses worldwide. Day to day, I'm helping businesses build out and scale their cloud workloads, usually with a heavy dose of infrastructure as code. As a consultant, I get to see how a wide variety of companies have implemented infrastructure as code and what does and doesn't work. And who is this talk for? Today, I'm not going to be explaining what infrastructure as code is or why you should stop clicking around in web consoles for your infrastructure needs. No, this talk is for anyone who has implemented infrastructure as code in their organization and can't seem to get all the benefits they were prom promised. If you or your team have ever been scared to make changes in your infrastructure code for fear of breaking things, or felt like you could do things faster if your tooling or code base wasn't standing in your way, then this is the talk for you. And if you don't think that describes you, I'd still encourage you to stick around, because you don't know what you don't know. Over the next 10 minutes, we'll describe how infrastructure as code should be making you feel, and steps you can take to get back on track if it isn't. After that, we'll briefly discuss how to make smart choices around your tooling to make sure your whole team can feel that way. But first up, infrastructure as code should make you feel safe. There should never be any fear of touching your infrastructure code base for risk of breaking things. There should not be doubt over what effects changes will have on your production environments. We don't have to triple check the cable we're about to unplug from the server rack because the cables aren't ours and the rack is in an undisclosed location in Ireland. If giving the new engineer right access to the infrastructure code gives you a tightness in your chest, here are some things to consider. Do you have a development environment? Your new starter should have the freedom to break things with impunity and make mistakes. The only way they can do that is if they have an environment to test changes on before they reach production. The good thing is that once your cloud resources are defining code, deploying new environments becomes trivial. So if you haven't already done it, do it. I'd imagine a few people watching this talk are probably rolling their eyes at this point. Having segregated environments for development, testing, and production is kind of table stakes. So I'd like to reword my question slightly. Do you really have a development environment? Sure, you may have an environment named development, but will anyone get mad if you break it? If someone accidentally blocking access to a database or deleting a Kubernetes cluster is going to slow down development for another team, then you don't have a development environment you are just maintaining someone else's. It's important for infrastructure engineers to have a true safe space for proving out infrastructure changes, whether this is in the form of a dedicated infrastructure development environment or more ephemeral sandbox environments, it doesn't really matter as long as nobody else is going to notice when something goes wrong. Another reason you may get an uneasy feeling in your stomach when clicking that merge button in GitHub is that you're not actually sure what your code changes are going to do. Most infrastructure as code tools have some form of dry run feature. In Terraform, they're called plans. In CloudFormation, they're called change sets. If that feature is available to you, then use it. And let your developers use it for all environments. Although we should always endeavor to make our different environments as similar as possible, there'll always be some amount of configuration that changes between them, which may influence how changes are applied. It's invaluable for an engineer to be able to see that their proposed code change results in the same infrastructure changes in their dev environment and production. This becomes even more important as the number of, number of environments scales up, perhaps due to a highly variable tenancy model for your application. Bonus points if these dry runs are automated on a pull request. Infrastructure as code should feel stable. Real-world infrastructure is expected to be long-lived and predictable. We rarely have to worry about the configuration of bridges and roads. They're just there when we need them, usually in the same position we last saw them. Although your application may not have the same service level objectives as the Golden Gate Bridge, you won't be able to achieve anything if you're building on a shifting sand pit. Your infrastructure is your rock solid foundation. If this doesn't ring true, then you might want to ask yourself a few questions. Is your infrastructure code coupled with your application? If you find yourself updating your infrastructure code alongside your application code frequently, this may imply that there is too much coupling between the two. Your infrastructure code base should have low churn. When changes are made, they should usually be additive. We often see high churn when the separation from different components or processes have been muddied. For example, perhaps the infrastructure's code tooling has taken on some responsibility for the versioning and deployment of the application itself. Something more appropriately left to your CI/CD system. This can often happen when using a serverless application framework, such as the serverless framework or AWS SAM. 
In, this, in these cases, you should think of the framework code as closer to your application than it is to your base infrastructure and organize it as such. Is your infrastructure as code the only game in town? Churn can happen if changes are being made reactively to keep code up to date with the state of your resources. If manual changes are being retroactively applied to your infrastructure code, then that process should be inverted, otherwise everything will, will just be getting done twice. When feasible, it's a good idea to enforce this rule in your permissions model. If something is managed by infrastructure as code, it should be impossible for someone to change it manually outside of emergency circumstances. It may also be that the case that the changes are being made to keep up with an automated system. For example, the value of a secret changing due to an automated rotation, or the version of a container image being updated by some other deployment process. In these cases, it can be useful to ignore such changes if your tooling permits it. Infrastructure as code should feel comprehensible. Nobody should be backing away from making a change to your infrastructure because they can't reason about the code. If you can't understand the code, then you can't understand the infrastructure. And if you don't understand the infrastructure, then you can't fix it when it breaks. Why might this be? Is your logic too complex? Infrastructure as code is not the place to be doing any kind of data processing. The mantra should always be to keep it simple stupid, with small interfaces and shortest path from configuration inputs to usage. Some tools, particularly those which allow you to use general purpose languages to define your infrastructure, like CDK, give you the option to add as much logic as you like, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Any kind of processing that is done to determine whether a resource is deployed or what values to give its attributes is a cognitive burden that will need to be picked up by the next engineer to look at the code. Inversely, you can find yourself in situations where a tool's limited expressiveness does not allow you, allow you to implement some logic you actually need in a concise manner. This will happen more with declarative tools like Terraform. While you should always check to make sure the complexity is truly required and that you are holding your tools the way they were designed to be, when you are forced into complexity, it should be heavily documented. Are there too many abstractions? Features like Terraform's modules allows defining smaller, repeatable units. While great for keeping things dry, they can also hide away a lot of complexity. A common mistake is to identify a useful pattern emerging in your infrastructure as code definitions, and then assuming that pattern will always hold in future. Although it may work well to modularize that pattern now, as infrastructure needs change, usages may diverge and have different requirements. When it comes time to de detangle those dependencies, you'll find that refactoring is trickier than with normal application programming, as you have to not only worry about the end state, but the transition between code changes and how that affects your currently running resources. Moreover, one may feel enticed to import a community module from the internet without fully understanding what it does under the hood. Remember, when you are trying to debug an issue, it doesn't matter who originally wrote the code, but who is reading it. Understanding the third-party code you use is important for keeping a good mental model of the infrastructure. Think twice before importing that highly parameterized 5,000-line module to save yourself from writing three resource definitions. Your security team will thank you too. Sometimes the fix for magic abstractions can be as simple as thinking of a great name for your module. And don't be scared to break up modules into smaller chunks if that makes the architecture clearer. Infrastructure as code should feel fast. It should never feel faster to change something manually if it is already defined in code. Some food for thought. Most infrastructure as code tools will actively query your running resources to calculate changes and detect drift. The larger the project, the longer this process takes. You may even get rate limited by your cloud provider. Splitting your projects up into smaller deployable chunks can reduce the time your tooling takes to refresh its state. Is there enough automation? The beauty of infrastructure as code is its ability to be written once and deployed many times. However, if that deployment process is manually running your infrastructure as code tooling on your laptop against every single environment, then small changes to infrastructure may require the same amount of effort as updating your systems directly. Just like an application can benefit from CI/CD, so can your infrastructure as code. Quite a few of the issues we've already covered can merely be symptoms of a deeper issue. If your tooling's feature set doesn't match the needs of your applications or its workflow doesn't match the expertise of your team, trouble will follow. So before I leave you today, let's take a moment to look at how to choose the best infrastructure as code tool for your team. The first thing to consider is your application. Where does it run? Is it all running in a single cloud provider like AWS, or are you calling out to multiple different vendors and stitching solutions together? 
How complex is your architecture? Do you, need to, do you need a tool which allows you to break up a larger state into smaller, more understandable components? Or is it feasible that your entire infrastructure could be covered off with a few hundred lines of YAML? And finally, can the tool slot neatly into your existing application build and deploy pipelines? There isn't a one-size-fits-all tool here. Each has a trade-off. For example, each cloud provider has their own first-party infrastructure as code tools, like CloudFormation for AWS. These have a very clear limitation in that they generally can only control the life cycle of a resource from their respective platforms. However, when it comes to automation, they're great because it's a single API call to apply a template which you're, with your provider handling everything else for you behind the scenes. The other thing to consider when selecting your tool is who are the people that are going to be using it and what is their skill set? Do you need to choose a tool which is implemented in a language your devs are already familiar with? Even when choosing a tool where the language is familiar, do your engineers have the cloud expertise they will need to implement safe and scalable infrastructure or they need some training? Does your team have the bandwidth to maintain a bespoke integration of a tool or should you be looking for more, something more off the shelf? A tool is only as good as the hands that wield it, so it's critically important to understand the capabilities of your team. Let's quickly take a look at a couple of examples. On the left here, we have a startup they're using JavaScript at every level of their application stack, and as they're in early stages, have relatively simple infrastructure needs that can all be met by various AWS services. They currently have only a handful of devs who tend to wear many hats at once, and so don't have a dedicated infrastructure team. A good choice for them would be AWS Cloud Development Kit, as it allows them to write their infrastructure as code in JavaScript and keep the benefits of being a single language shop. CDK doesn't support non-AWS non services out of the box, but that's okay. They only need AWS. On the right, we have the polar opposite organization, a large enterprise with many products all using different tech stacks with different cloud providers. To manage this sprawling infrastructure, they have a dedicated team. This organization would be well served using a tool like Terraform. It has provider plugins for a huge number of cloud services, including all major, major cloud providers, so it ticks that box. It doesn't use a common general purpose programming language, but that's okay, as the dedicated infrastructure team will largely be the ones interacting with the code base. And if they are like any of the other infrastructure people I've met, they probably prefer Terraform anyway. Ultimately, infrastructure as code should make you feel zen. If it doesn't, then some introspection is required to analyze what could be going wrong. It should be safe, stable, understandable, and fast. You can use that time it saves you to meditate on the veranda. Thank you very much. I've been George, and don't be afraid to reach out if you have any questions.